Hello and welcome. Sri Lankan forces say they've won Asia's longest war. In the past few hours, the Tamil Tigers, who'd previously managed their own army, police, courts and even taxation system, effectively surrendered to the Sri Lankan army. And no one knows how the struggle for an independent Tamil homeland will turn now, but one thing is certain, the country's facing a massive humanitarian crisis. More than 200,000 people are living in squalid refugee camps after fleeing the intense fighting of the past few months. Struggling to cope with a flood of weak, traumatized and often injured people, the Sri Lankan government has asked for urgent international assistance. But at the same time, it has also limited the access that international relief organizations have to the overcrowded camps. So on today's show, we ask, now that the guns are silenced, how will Sri Lanka deal with its humanitarian crisis? Remember, you can join the conversation with your questions and comments. Log on to livestation.com forward slash AJE, enter the chat room and take part. And we also welcome your phone calls on the show. With me today to discuss the issues is John Holmes, the top United Nations official in charge of humanitarian affairs and emergency relief, overseeing the UN's relief efforts around the world. He joins us today from New York. Sir John, thanks for being with us. Pleasure. So let me start with that issue in Sri Lanka. We will go on to the, uh, the issue of the UN report on uh, uh, disaster risk reduction uh, a little later in the show. But let me start with the situation in Sri Lanka where the humanitarian crisis uh, is, is reaching a fairly uh, intense proportion for uh, uh, the international aid agencies to deal with. Uh, in the first instance, what can be done for those uh, caught in the fighting or caught in, in, uh, in the situation following the fighting, but of course now having limited access from the international aid agencies? I think the first thing to say is that we're immensely relieved that the fighting is now actually over and all those civilians who've been trapped there, as far as we can tell, and we haven't got absolute confirmation from the ground because we're actually present on the ground in that conflict zone, we believe all those people, those civilians have now left the zone and, and therefore at least they're not at risk of being killed or injured by the intense fighting and that was our particular preoccupation for the last weeks and months. Now, as you say, we have to deal with the consequences of all those people who fled probably between 250 and 280,000 people altogether. We've been working with the government for, for months now, setting up the camps, trying to make sure that the conditions for them are as good as they can be. We've got a long way to go because a lot of people have arrived in a very short time, providing the shelter, the food, the water, the medical care they need uh, in those conditions is not easy, but we'll get there. Even though Mr. the people John, we're dealing with... What is there in a situation such as that in Sri Lanka where the conflict has been so long running that both sides have been entrenched and uh, for so long in, in their own positions and there have been generations basically conditioned to know nothing else? Well, that's a, uh, once we've actually sorted out the humanitarian assistance, then we have, of course, to turn to the, the future. How do we heal these dreadful wounds left by, by so many years of conflict and in particular the very bitter last few weeks of fighting? We need to find a way of reconciling the communities and making sure they can move on to the kind of political settlement. And what that means for us in particular is that the people in the camps need to be treated well, allowed to move around, allowed to go back to their homes as quickly as possible, and in the meantime are treated in accordance with all the standards and principles which apply in these, these circumstances. We'll do our part. We need to make sure that we work with the government to make sure that everybody does their part, including them. Well, we have a call on the line from, from Dubai. Uh, Bren is with us. Uh, what would you like to ask, Bren? Hi, Rachel. Right. Just to ask, it's more or less like an opinion. Mm -hmm, Can you hear me? Yes, go on, please. Okay, uh, just to let you know, I'm a Sri Lankan Tamil, and I left Sri Lanka when I was like 20 uh, or 19 to Dubai. When I was in Colombo, I had no issues with the Sinhalese people. It's a total exaggeration of the media uh, saying that the Sinhalese people are or like rude or, or they they're being uh, uh, not treating the Tamil people in Sri Lanka properly for me today is a very very happy day because the war has ended you cannot have negotiations with terrorists the uh, liberation tigers of Tamil Elam so called they think they are the proper representatives of this uh, Tamil people but they are not me being a Tamil I'm ashamed to call them uh, okay, them Brent? Yes. Brent, th thanks for that comment. I, I do. So, John, you, you did indicate, of course, the relief is that the fighting has stopped. But, of course, when something is as long running as, as, as the conflict in Sri Lanka, it's, it's not going to end uh, completely, is it? It's, it's, it's likely that some sort of scenario, conflict scenario, will continue. How can you prepare for that? Well, I hope we don't have to prepare for that. I think we need to make sure that, that the peace can be won as well as the war being won. That's the most important thing. And that's not going to be easy. 
uh, whatever the views of, of, of the, the, the man who just spoke, and I appreciate very much what he said, nevertheless there are many Tamils inside and outside Sri Lanka who feel bitter about this, who did support the LTTE, however wrong-headed we might think that might be, and therefore we need to have the kind of reconciliation process and a generous approach to the Tamil community now from the government uh, to make sure we don't go back to some kind of guerrilla conflict. Uh, as I say, in the meantime, we can do our best, to, uh, as we will, to help the people in the camps, but the most important thing is that they're able to go home quickly right. uh, and resume their lives and become full and equal and normal citizens of Sri Lanka, which is a united country. We had an email that came in from Bangalore in India, if I can put this one to you, from SKS, who wrote in saying, unless the defeat of the LTTE is followed by an honourable political deal to the Tamil minority, ethnic strife will recur. There may be a need for foreign intervention to save Tamil civilians. Echoing what you just said, Sir John, but uh, also also, it makes me wonder to what degree you find yourself tangled in the politics while trying to, to basically deal with the humanitarian crisis. Well, we're used to, to, to trying to deal with the humanitarian situation in highly politi politicized environments, and this is one of them. Of course, my political colleagues in the UN will be the ones who are trying to work with the Sri Lankan government and others to take this pro political process forward, if they want our help, of course. We are certainly ready to help, but that needs to be everybody to, to want us to be there. My particular concerns are humanitarian, but inevitably in these circumstances, the humanitarian, in particular proper treatment to people, uh, that does have political consequences, and that's why it's so important to get it right. A call from London. Laris uh, Waran is on the line. Uh, go ahead, Laris. Oh, hello. Good evening. Hi, My question is, why did the UN develop a proper system to protect the minorities around the world who are being persecuted by these racist states, uh, especially like Sri Lanka, who has been doing this since 1956? This is not a new thing. Laris? They have carried out massacres time to time, okay. 1956, 1956. Laris, Laris let me put, this, put it this way to Sir John. Oh, I mean, the first part of the question really refers to how the what sort of kind of um, structure the UN has in dealing with uh, these kind of conflicts. There's, of course, there's issues such as Darfur. We'll get on to Pakistan in a minute. What kind of um, structure is there within the United Nations to deal with uh, prevention of these kind of situations uh, to avoid humanitarian crises? Well, of course, we do have conflict prevention and mediation uh, people inside the UN who can try to help. Uh, it's very difficult to help and to avoid these situations if the people concerned, the two sides don't actually want you to intervene. And in this case, particularly, they didn't want us to intervene, neither the LTT nor indeed the, the government wanted us to, to, to be involved in this struggle, if you like. Uh, so there wasn't a lot we could do. Uh, in general, we are trying to protect, we are trying to promote mediation in conflicts like this, and of course, trying to protect minorities wherever we can, because the UN, one of the roles of the UN is to be the voice of the, of the minorities um, and of the people, uh, the poorest people or the most oppressed people, wherever they may be. Mm -hmm. We've got a call from South Africa. Savani's on the line. Savani? Go ahead, Savani. Uh, hello. Hi, go um, I'd just like to know, um, this humanitarian crisis has been carrying on for a number of months, and the Sri Lankan government was committing war crimes. Why has, um, why has the international community, bodies like the UN, the EU, waited so long um, before they've actually done anything? And now while we're talking about um, charging people with war crimes, there are thousands and thousands of people still stuck there in the war zone. and. Uh, no aid is being allowed to get through to them. Okay, well, Isn't uh, the priority to help those people at the moment? I think we touched on that, Sir John, but on the issue of um, accountability. Um, in these kind of conflicts, and, and, and Sir John, you yourself have dealt, for example, with the Northern Ireland situation, what, what, what um, difficulties you face in creating some kind of accountability for those involved in the conflict who may have committed uh, such crimes, uh, and yet at the same time trying to move forward so that it doesn't plague the prospect of long-term peace? I think that's always a very difficult balance to strike uh, between peace and justice. The, the two are not opposed concepts, of course, but it's sometimes difficult to find the right sequencing between those events. I think accountability has to be important. There has to be light shed on these affairs, and there has to be uh, no impunity in international life as in national life. Otherwise, uh, bad precedents are set, and there's no discouragement uh, for those who are actually breaking international humanitarian law, whoever they may be. But in any particular situation, that's quite difficult to pursue. Some difficult balances are there to strike. Now, it's not my, my job to actually pass judgment on those questions. There are others uh, who are there for that. Um, but as I say, it's a difficult balance to strike, and it's different in each situation. Well, let's, let's see how this works out. The European Union have called for an inquiry. The, uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, has also talked about that possibility. Let's see how far we can get with that. Okay, London on the line. Taya, you have a question or comment? 
Yes, uh, I'm calling from London. My name is Daya. Oh, Daya. Uh, okay. I want to ask, uh, oh, no, I want to tell you now, um, one of my friends just came from Sri Lanka within two weeks ago. He had been beaten by the police in Vallavatta because he's a Tamil has gone from London to Sri Lanka for a funeral. Because he's a Sri Lankan Tamil, they have been beaten up and told him, you have uh, come from demonstration, one. Second thing, then the one police officer covered his face and asked him 1,500 rupees. Sorry, uh, one uh, hour. Yes. So I was going to say, of course, we're going to see there are going to be a lot of incidents uh, reported like this where there are going to be individuals I facing can, certain situations. Uh, but, Sir John, I want to ask you, when, when you've got uh, an issue, you've got obviously Sri Lanka and it's quite a, uh, an emotional debate for a lot of people calling in. When you have um, the situation in Sri Lanka, we've got the situation in Pakistan right now in the northwest uh, uh, region of Pakistan where it's uh, getting up to about two million people having fled the, uh, the area. Uh, and, and you've got two or three other conflicts going on, uh, creating huge uh, refugee uh, uh, movements. How how do you deal with the resource issue um, as, as, the, as the United Nations trying to stretch yourself among so many crises? Well, clearly it's a problem, and I wish there was only two or three more crises. There's probably 15 or 20, actually, which we're dealing with in Sudan right. or Somalia or the Democratic Republic of Congo or the occupied Palestinian territory. There are many, many territory. There are many of these crises simultaneously. What we have to do is make sure we are responding not according to the dictates of the media, but according to the dictates of the needs of the people on the ground, whoever they may be, whatever the politics may be, that's what we have to be driven by. We then have to, to raise the resources. The whole humanitarian budget for a year is around $12 billion, which, of course, pales into its insignificance behind, uh, besides the average financial bailout. We don't think that's a lot of money, but we have to raise it mostly from governments. We have some generous donor governments, and then we have to make sure that we can spread that money around in a fair way between the people who are suffering. And that's no easy task, but that's, that's what we're trying to do. Between the UN agencies, and of course the NGOs are very important in this too, because they perform a hugely important function, usually in the most difficult and dangerous places. We're going to take a short break now, but uh, more of our discussion in a moment, looking especially at the UN uh, Global Assessment Report on Disaster Risk Reduction. As we pause, let me remind you, you can join the conversation with your questions and comments. Log on to livestation.com and into the chat room. There's a debate taking place there right now, as you can see. We'll be right back. <laughs> Don't you get out of the car? Don't you get out of the car? Don't you get out of the car?